after her husband died from tuberculosis at the age of 43 in 1881. Sarah Winchester inherited $20 million and 50% of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company stock. Sarah stayed on the East Coast for several years before leaving New Haven, Connecticut and traveling west. Struck by an incredible amount of loss and overwhelmed by grief, Sarah Winchester went in search of something beyond her horizon. She found a home that she purchased in 1886. The Winchester Mystery House started as an eight-room farmhouse located in San Jose, California, and now boasts of 161 rooms of Victorian-style architecture. The house is crawling with aporias, including doors and stairs leading to nowhere, spiderwebs on the windows, and long, winding corridors. To perpetuate the superstition, the number 13 is found all over the house. According to legend, the erratic architecture was all designed to confuse the spirits who haunted Sarah Winchester. Rumor has it, Sarah even slept in a different room every night so the spirits would not know where to find her. Despite all of the possibilities of perspectives, there's really only ever one story that is told, and it's one of darkness. The story told about this mansion has taken on a life of its own. Sarah Winchester supposedly kept construction going for 39 years because the constant hammering would drive away unfriendly spirits. When visitors first enter the home on their tour, their eardrums are violated by the same incessant hammering sound that haunts the narrative. Sarah's unwillingness to conform to expectations combined with strange architectural choices, not to mention an incredible amount of wealth, left everyone wondering about Sarah's life and home. Just like the Winchester Mystery House left the public with a profound sense of paradox, instead of remaining in that ambiguity, the public imagination band together to invent reasons for Sarah's odd behavior. But what would it take to rethink the Winchester Mystery House? First, we need to establish the haunting narrative hidden beneath the floorboards that has motivated more than 12 million people to visit since tours were first offered in 1923. If spirits did haunt Sarah Winchester, who were they? It is said that the spirits who haunted her were from those who lost their lives to the Winchester repeating rifle the gun her husband's family made their fortune selling. An early version of this weapon helped the Union Army find success in the Civil War. An evolved version of this weapon aided Western expansion and was marketed as the gun that won the West. This weapon could fire 15 bullets before reloading. The spirits haunting Sarah then are supposedly those who died at the hand of her husband, not directly, but from the weapon that he sold all over the world. This piece of technology was a paradox in the American mind, a paradox embodied in the memory of Sarah Winchester and manifested in the erratic architecture of her home. This gun was responsible for both taking life and generating wealth on levels difficult to imagine. Is it possible that Americans were the guilty ones? Were they so unwilling to look in the mirror and take responsibility for their own actions that Sarah Winchester and her home functioned as the scapegoat for gun violence, Native American genocide, and civil war? Perhaps Sarah did feel immense guilt for the part she played in the slaughtering of so many. Or perhaps this version of the story is easier for people to wrap their minds around because sitting with Sarah in her pain might be uncomfortable. Sarah and William lost their only child, Annie Pardee Winchester, five weeks after she was born. 150 years later, I witnessed Annie's name written in red paint on the wall of the Winchester Mystery House, a house she never lived in. In a nine year period, Sarah lost her infant daughter, husband, mother, and six other family members. 
So how did Sarah's grief and pain turn into such a spectacle? Two years after Sarah's death, Houdini held a seance here on Halloween night. Following his stay, a journalist asked him about his experience. He called the home a mystery of mysteries, a name that stuck, a name that has haunted the mansion ever since. Two years later, Houdini died on the same night, a death that adds life to the story. What I want to offer you today is a way to rethink the Winchester Mystery House that embraces the profound paradox pulsing through these walls. If the spirit world did play a part in her motives for building, it was no more prominent than her motivation to dwell. For Martin Heidegger, to dwell is to cherish and protect, to preserve and care for. This is the spirit that characterizes Sarah's life. The way Sarah ornaments the home reflects her worldwide aesthetic taste and offers a kaleidoscope of perspectives into her life. In the profound essay on aesthetics, called In Praise of Shadows, Japanese writer Junichiro Tanizaki challenges Western thinkers to learn from the East by searching for beauty in the darkness. The French philosopher Paul Ricoeur offers a transformative approach to reading architecture that opens up the vertiginous possibilities of a space to celebrate ambiguity. His scheme starts with something called prefiguration. This idea calls for the reader or the visitor to question pre-existing beliefs about a space, just like we might at the beginning of a narrative. These beliefs are intimately tied to the who of the action. For a core then, every biography takes place in a life space. The difficulty in determining Sarah Winchester's biography is that her privacy kept much of the narrative opaque. Unlike our Eastern counterparts, Western minds have the tendency to conflate darkness, in this case, opacity, with danger instead of beauty. After inheriting such immense wealth, Sarah was expected to maintain her status by attending social gatherings, perhaps with the Berkeleys or the Stanfords, her neighbors down the road, or even host her own events in her grand ballroom. Similarly, the construction of her home set another kind of expectation, one wherein the building would eventually be complete. To this day, there are stairs and doors leading to nowhere. Because Sarah's actions in life and construction defied expectations, the public gaze continually configures her narrative in their own image. Configuration, for Paul Ricoeur, prompts the reader to determine whether the character of a narrative acts according to previously identified expectations. It is difficult to determine all of the reasons for her architectural choices. The result of a confused public attempting to understand their role in the violence of a nation is a way to make sense of a wealthy, grieving woman who was an architect, a landowner, an orchard farmer with worldly tastes and a refusal to play into society's expectations. This level of reading is where the public freely and creatively invents their own narratives to make sense of her home. Nietzsche teaches us that truths are illusions about which we have forgotten that that is what they are, and this is precisely how the fiction invented to make sense of the Winchester Mystery House is so strong. As a result, the space is considered haunted to this day. The third stage in Paul Ricoeur's approach to architecture and narrativity is called refiguration. Refiguration is when history and fiction, truths and illusions, come together to transform our earlier readings. The guides of the Winchester Mystery House said again and again, whether there were spirits and seances during Sarah's life, we will never know, but there is definitely activity in our present day. While touring the basement area, my guide kept looking down the hall or behind the group as if there was something there. When we were walking upstairs and passed another tour group, my guide says to the other guide, the basement is definitely active today. Every time a new visitor walks through this space, 
new connections are made. The life of Sarah Winchester, the loss she was struck by, the house she constructed, the wealth she invested, the people she helped, the natural disasters she lived through, the stories repeated again and again every 20 minutes, the newspaper articles offering new insights, tall tales, and twisted lies. Every word uttered defies a static reading and perpetuates life. The Winchester Mystery House is refigured again and again. There is even more history that accounts for the erratic architecture, though. Certain events allow visitors to consider the space not as an answer to guilt, but as an answer to the grief that struck Sarah's life in the form of immense loss. On top of this grief, there was a natural disaster in 1906 that had a profound effect on this unfinished space. With this in mind, I want to propose a method of reading the Winchester Mystery House in a way that opens up and celebrates the rich connections made possible by dwelling poetically in this space. I call this reading a kind of transfiguration. I want visitors to see the life-giving beauty in Sarah Winchester and her home. Even though she was grief-stricken by the loss of those closest to her, her spirit was one of hospitality, charity, adventure, and inclusivity. Often the perpetual construction was for the purpose of building more comfortable living quarters for her servants and groundskeepers. Additionally, she used the space to host ice cream socials for the local orphanage, or used her wealth to anonymously give to charitable causes. The story we could tell of Sarah Winchester and her magnificent house is quite beautiful and reinforces that reading space with wonder has the potential to protect us against capitalism. The narrative told of this space drives the commercial use of the haunted house. But what if we could highlight her philanthropy? What if we could use her grief as a model for understanding the pain of our neighbor? After all, Sarah made every attempt to create a beautiful space, and creating beauty is a gift for the other. Working with a carpenter, Sarah Winchester was both the visionary and the architect behind this 24,000 square foot wonder. She subscribed to two architectural magazines and drove the construction of the home. Part of the reasoning behind the erratic architecture has to do with the simple fact that she built on a pre-existing structure. Shortly after purchasing the home, she began adding on rooms and floors to the bones of the house that once reached as high as seven floors. Standing on her observation deck, I imagine her releasing tiny clouds of grief into the open sky while fixing her gaze on the horizon. Heidegger reminds us, a boundary is not that at which something stops, but as the Greeks recognized, the boundary is that from which something begins its presencing. Whether yearning for an open sky or spending months at a time on her houseboat, she found a kind of rhythm in space that allowed her grief a form of expression. Virginia Woolf, a kindred spirit to Sarah Winchester, would write a letter three and a half years after Sarah's death that seems to resonate with a poetic reading of Sarah's artistic expression. Style is a very simple matter. It is all rhythm. Once you get that, you can't use the wrong words. But on the other hand, here I am sitting half the morning, crammed with ideas and visions and so on, and can't dislodge them for the lack of the right rhythm. Now this is very profound, and what rhythm is and goes far deeper than any words. A sight, an emotion, creates this wave in the mind long before it makes words to fit it. Writing was the medium in which Virginia Woolf chose to express the waves in her mind. And for Sarah Winchester, architecture embodies this same sense of wonder. Somehow, architecture is not awarded the same privilege of perpetual interpretation as writing especially in the case of the Winchester Mystery House. The repetition of the narrative has not evolved based on new information, but this is where we might borrow a lesson taught by Gaston Bachelard in extracting the poetics of space. 
He captures the essence of dynamic and potential energy at work in metaphors, even when a certain metaphor illustrates a space that sounds quiet or lacks movement. A creature that hides and withdraws into its shell is preparing a way out. This is true of the entire scale of metaphors, from the resurrection of a man in his grave to the sudden outburst of one who has long been silent. If we remain at the heart of the image under consideration, we have the impression that, by staying in the motionlessness of its shell, the creature is preparing temporal explosions, not to say whirlwinds of being. In some sense, her labyrinth of a home was the shell she withdrew into. One of the only book-length works on Sarah Winchester even calls her a captive of the labyrinth. An empathic reading in line with this author reveals Sarah Winchester is not trapped in the house as much as she is trapped in a fixed narrative. The labyrinth itself has an explanation. The long, winding corridors were long, shallow staircases that allowed Sarah a petite woman of only four foot ten, to ascend to the upper floors without aggravating her severe arthritis. There is a beautiful human explanation for most of Sarah's choices. Approximately 10,000 windows reveal her affinity for natural light. A love of stained glass windows accentuate this space with beautiful colors. Freedom of thought was something Sarah esteemed, and two stained glass windows located in the grand ballroom reveal how she might have built vertically because she was looking for a way out. Both windows display bold lines from two separate Shakespeare plays. The first window displays the line from Troilus and Cressetta, wide unclasp the tables of their thoughts. The second offers a line from Richard III. These same thoughts people this little world. These windows are traditionally read as a cry for help to escape out, but maybe Sarah was actually looking for a way in. Sarah anticipates what Martin Heidegger intuits in his profound essay, Building, Dwelling, Thinking. Building and thinking are, Heidegger writes, each in its own way, inescapable for dwelling. The goal of both building and thinking is dwelling. And remember, for Heidegger, to dwell is to cherish and protect, to preserve and care for. The care and consideration she manifested in her home was radically interrupted one spring evening. At approximately 5.12 p.m. on Wednesday, April 18, 1906, an earthquake that reached a magnitude as high as 8.3 shook California. The epicenter was off the shore of San Francisco, leaving 80% of San Francisco destroyed. Entire sections of the Winchester Mystery House were lost, including the seventh floor observation deck. Rather than rebuild them, Sarah Winchester erred on the side of conservation and practicality in her later years and decided to seal off the areas. This is the reason for the stairs that lead to nowhere, and the second floor door that opens to a tragic fall. Can we refigure the building in a way that offers a rational explanation for the aporias in this space? Can we transfigure the building in a way that doesn't just search for reason, but celebrates a kind of poetic dwelling? Just like the Winchester Mystery House, Paul Ricoeur says metaphor has a unique structure but two functions, a rhetorical function and a poetic function. Perhaps it's time we perpetuate the poetry of the Winchester Mystery House.